Good morning from Vietnam, Dan. Thanks a lot for spending your afternoon, your evening with us and sharing your stories in our Inside Sharing Show. And on behalf of the listeners around the world, we want to say thank you for your generosity. Sure, it's great to be with you. And uh, as I shared with you earlier, you know, please accept our invitation for you and your husband to travel and come to Vietnam. So uh, if you decided to go here, then please let us know. I will make sure that uh, my family will stay and uh, take you guys around town, okay? That sounds great. <laughs> and then, uh, in our culture, it's very um, honor for our audience if we can have you to do a little introduction about who you are and the work that you do. Could you please do that for us? Sure. Well, basically, I'm an author, and I've done that for the last three decades, and actually more than three decades, I've been writing. But because of the writing, I get a lot of invitations to speak and do, do keynotes here and there. And I had a, a training company that actually developed because of the, the writing. So I, when I'm acting as a consultant, I work with organizations to help them communicate clearly, and I work with individuals to help them increase their presence and uh, extend their influence, sometimes just personally one-on-one -on -one, and sometimes with a published book. Uh, and then uh, in this uh, conversation, we're going to explore in, uh, uh, you know, the journey that taking you to become an expert in communications, all right? So we need to travel time together. Are you okay with that? Sure, sure. All right, all righty, let's travel time. When I was very, very young, I... Uh, it was a kid, I, I wanted to become an astronaut. So wearing the suit and jumping in different planets, it seems cool to me, but life did not give me any opportunity doing anything close to what I wanted to be. And so we want to know what, what Diana's dream was when, she, when you were young. Well, actually, I didn't have much of a career dream when mm. I was young because I grew up on a farm. My, my dad was a tenant farmer and we were a very small town, rural area, and I really had no idea or picture of what the big world was out there. Mm. Uh, when I became a, a junior in high school, 11th grade, we moved to the big city, which is now a part of the DFW Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, and so I the whole world opened up for me, but I still didn't have any career plans. And then um, I guess it was when that first book came out that, uh, well, I'll have to back up a little bit mm. uh, where it really started. My husband was at that time was suffering from severe mental, um, well, I call it depression, but mm. he was in and out of psychiatric hospitals. And so I knew I was going to have to make a living. And so I went to a, a family friend of mine and I asked, you know, how am I going to make a living? I have two small children that I need to be home for. And he said, well, what would you like to do? Mm. And I thought, oh, gee, I don't know. I can't. And finally I said, well, I like to write English compositions in, in high school, but how can you make a living doing that? And he said, oh, no, I didn't ask you how you could make a living. I asked you what you'd like to do. Mm. If you like to write, figure out how to make a living at it. So yeah. that was a different concept for me. So I literally went to the public library and checked out all of the books in the 800 section. We didn't have Google back then to, to do that for us, you know. So I checked out all these books, about 50 or 60 books, filled up the back seat of my car and went home and just read around the clock all about how to write, you know how to write greeting card verses to romance novels, to mysteries, to, to business books. And that's how I got started. Wow. Well, Diana, so writing is to be, seems to be the thing that you really, really loved back then, right? So uh, yeah. in, in your imagination, was you ever thought of, you know, you're going to be a famous uh, author ever? <laughs> no, the thought never entered my mind. Uh -huh. Now, I will have to say, when I first got excited about it, mm. I thought, gee, you know, all I have to do is I have a I have a card table sitting up in my bedroom and a typewriter back then, not even a computer. I'll just write this big novel, send it off, and the movie version will come out. <laughs> but you know, that was that was the dream, that was the funny part of it. But I, in reality, when I really got down to it, um, I thought, no, there's no way I'm gonna ever sell a book. There's no way I really can 
get known or even make a living doing this back back at that time. I didn't even know an author. I'd never ever met an author. I'd never gone to a big conference or, or conference center to hear speakers. It was just a whole unknown world. It's just that writing was something I loved to do. And so I said, okay, I've got to make some money. I've got to stay home. My husband's not going to be able to support us. I've got to stay home and figure out a way to make money. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. And it turned out really, really well for you. But I want to bring you to the moment of you writing your first book because the, you know, from zero to one is the hardest thing, right? So the, the first book always is, is the best memory to remember. So bring us back to that, to that time and tell me, Tell us how the journey took place for you to write in the first one, though. Okay. Well, actually, I wrote an article because that seemed to be easier. You get uh. paid for articles. Now, you know, people put things on blogs and they write and don't get paid for it. But back then, you would send in things to magazines that mm. were really print and paper, you know, ink on paper and get paid for it. So I sent an article in and the editor uh, called me and said, would you like to turn this into a book? And I went, yeah, sure, for sure. <laughs> and that was for young adults at that point. It, the, the article that I had written was how teens can adjust to the parents' move. You know, when they move across the street or across the USA, from, you know, and, and they're away from their friends, there are a lot of adjustments that teens make. And sometimes they get really angry at their parents. That was the article. And they said, can you make that into a book for parents, how to help their kids make this move? And I thought, sure. <laughs> And, and so that was the first book I wrote, but in, I wrote it really quickly. And that, I do have a system for writing quickly. Once I got that out, before it even was released, I was already starting on a novel and starting on a business book. So I just kept going. And then when they were released, right in, even in the first two or three years, I had like three books released, one, one in every category for young adults, for a novel for adults and a business book. And then your journey to writing starting to steer on to communications and, and having organization and, and indeed individual to get better at uh, communication, right? So out of, because as a writer, you can choose to write anything in any topic, in any areas, right? But why communications? Yes. yes. And I, I kind of kept two uh, paths uh -huh. going in my career. After that first book came out, uh, for young adults, Simon & Schuster came to me, their Mesner division for, of Simon & Schuster, and said, we, we would like to give you a series. Can you write a whole series of books for mm -hmm. young adults? And so I began to do that and eventually wrote uh, six books in that series. Mm -hmm. And then that first book, uh, a Christian publisher, spiritual publisher, religious publisher, contacted me about that book. And so I wrote that book and started writing a lot of books in the spiritual arena, in, in the Christian arena. And then at the same time, again, in those first two years, um, when I went on TV, I was doing a lot of television interviews and uh, clients started to call. And the, the first book, actually, before it even was released, uh, somebody said, you know, you, we pay a lady big bucks to come in here to this oil company and teach us how to write, and you're writing a book on that. And so they started inviting me in, and when I did this first TV interview, IBM saw me uh -huh. on that TV and said, uh, can you come up and talk to us about teaching all of our systems engineers and salespeople this? <laughs> so uh, even before the book came out, while I was doing the pre-publicity, I got leads to do you know, speaking and training, so it just all kind of snowballed at once. I was writing in three different areas. Wow, and and how do you how do you find time out of your busy schedule of training of of speaking and still having time to to write though, and Jan? Well, it, it I will have to say it is a challenge mm. for uh, particularly for parents when they have small children. After children get up a certain age, they're in school most of the day, and that's not so hard. But uh, I do remember the day when my kids, I would get up at like five in the morning and work until they woke up. And then uh, when they were toddlers and when my uh, daughter wasn't in a, at a nap or, you know, down in her bed for a nap in the afternoon, I would have her on my shoulder, you know, <laughs> juggling her on my shoulder, trying to keep her asleep while I wrote. And then after I, they, I put them to bed at night, I was writing. So that, that's really a challenge. But I think um, I was blessed with a mom who is extremely organized. My dad too, but especially my mom. And so I just learned by 
osmosis, I guess, observing them, how to organize and plan my day and, you know, all the principles. In fact, I even wrote a book that's on productivity called Get a Life that came out years ago. Uh, but it was about being organized in your life. So that's, that's helped tremendously. Yeah, wow, wow. Diana, bring me back to the moment that you asked your friend, a uh, person that you know advises on what to do, right? <laughs> Who's that person? Uh, that happened to be a business, a business minister at our large church. Ah. And he, you know, he did counseling. And so when I went in to, to talk to him, I've got, to, I've got to support us. We have no way of making a living here yeah. now that my husband's in the hospital. He's the one that gave me that advice. He was a good, good personal friend and also on staff there at the church. Wow, wow. He gave you the advice really, 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 really good. You know, a lot of people will tell you to find a job and get a, a stable income to cover for your, yeah, for your family. Yeah, and then they you, tell you to go find out. Then they, then they tell you to go find a hobby, but no, his advice was great when he said, find something you love mm. and then figure out a way to make a living at it. And after years, did you ever come to him and, and share with him, you know, how that advice affects your life? Actually, I have, we lost touch. We moved away. He, he moved away, but I know he's gotten my book, so he knows <laughs> that, that that advice paid off for me for sure. I, he was much older, so I, I don't even know if he's still living, but... Uh, but he did know that I had had success in publishing. Yeah, and Diana, if you bring, uh, if we bring you back to that moment, you sat down with him asking for his advices, right? And then the statement that he gave you was really, really big statement for a young girl, you know, having, uh, you know, to stay home, taking care for, you know, uh, your family, and you need to to find a source of income. So doing something that you love to do is, is really, really fulfilling. But it's, it's, it's hard to see, you know, the result at the end of the month, like you're going to work for an organization and get paid by the end of the month, right? So uh, that big message was a, a bit, uh, you know, like blurry for, for a lot of people. So I want to know at that moment, what trigger in your head, you know, that took you to drive all the way to the library and get tons of books? Uh, about writing and, and bring home and read them though? Well, actually, they, I, I've left out a, just a little interlude that was really the motivator, that really gave me the courage yeah. to make this change. And that is when my husband was in the hospital and when I knew I had had this conversation with him, uh, I had an organization that contacted me and asked me if I would like to write for them. And that would be a you know, a paid assignment. Not, most of the time you just write a book and you hope you get paid, you hope people buy it. Mm -hmm. But back then they were going to actually pay me for this series of uh, curriculum. And I was teaching school, doing some substitute teaching to make ends meet while he was in the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I said, I, I just, I want to go do that assignment, but I can't do that because they want to do some training. You have to go to a conference and now I'm working full time. And how can I, you know, teach at school? How can I do that? And so I was just, I stayed awake for like three nights. I did not sleep. I was so, uh, so stressed mm. about our future for the family. And so I got up, it was about three o'clock in the morning. I got my Bible. I walked into my family room. I sat down and I think, God, I have to have an answer. I'm going to mm. go crazy here if I don't have an answer. And I feel like it was just this clearest thought as a bail. Right. Quit your job and write. And I, it was such a strong feeling, mm. such a strong thought that I thought, this is it. This is, I'm going to do this. And so I went into school the next morning to my principal and I said, look, I want to stop. This was like in November, late November. And I said, I want to offer my resignation at midterm, which would have been the middle of January. And he said, oh, no problem. He said, that's kind of routine. We hate to see you go, but just write out your resignation letter. And, uh, you know, I'll present and said, there happens to be a school board meeting tonight and I will actually present it at the school board meeting. And so I thought, great, I, I understand God, this is my purpose, God's purpose for my life. Everything's cool. And on the, it, like I said, this was a small town. I'm driving into school the next morning and I hear they give all this, you know, local news on the, on the radio. And I hear that as I'm driving, it says the local school board meets uh, met last night in session and they voted to do this, that, and the other. And all of a sudden they said, and they voted to reject Diana Booth's resignation. <laughs> and I thought, oh, I, I, I was 
was sure that's what I was supposed to do. I was sure that was my purpose for life. How could this happen? And so I parked the car, walked into the principal's office, and I said, what happened? You told me it was just routine. If I resigned, I always accepted your resignation. And he said, well, that's generally true, but in your case, the reason they rejected it is we don't have anybody else to teach Spanish. That we have absolutely no applicants, and so they're not going to let you out of your contract. And so, of course, what that meant is I couldn't accept the writing assignment. I couldn't do what I, I felt was my calling. And so I just stood for another four days, four days. I thought, what am I going to do? <laughs> and the fourth, in four days, the principal sends a note to my conference period while I was teaching and said, see me after school. <laughs> so I go down to his, his office after school, and he said, guess what? He said, I just had a call from a woman who's looking for a job and she's moving back to the city to take care of her mom and she wants to teach Spanish. Uh. <laughs> and so he said, so the bottom line, we're going to let you out of your contract. So I think your question was, you know, what motivated me, what kept going? I think it was knowing that God had a purpose for me. This was my purpose. This was my passion. And just that sort of double confirmation, you know, mm. that I got an invitation to start writing and a paycheck for it, but also that teacher moving back out of the blue in the middle of the year saying to this small school, I want to teach Spanish. Beautiful. So that's get every time I get discouraged when I'm writing and I think, you know, is anybody going to read this book? I think back to those incidences mm. and they give me, you know, encouragement and confidence to keep going. Beautiful. And the purpose of our show is to help people to find their purpose also, Aunt Diana. Um, so back into that seven days of stress and thinking and stuff, right? Yes. There, those incidents that happened that, uh, that you found your calling and you respond really, really proactively to the, to the calling. Is there any yes. way, any sign that you can share that secret to other people? So if they know that there's a calling upon them, they need to listen and respond to that? Um, yes, I think there there's several ways. In fact, I, it's been a long time. I used to speak on that occasionally. I haven't done that in a long time. But one of the ways, I, I call them the six Ps, and I can't remember for sure what they all stood for, but one, uh, you need to have a, a plan, mm. you, you, you know, somehow if you have a calling, you have a plan to get there. Mm. Uh, and then I called one a, a plot. You have to have a, you have a situation or circumstance that, that allows you to do what you're doing. Uh, one other test is your passion. How, how passionate are you mm. about doing this? And then I think there are, uh, confirmations praise from other people when mm. they see you do what you do and it works out well for you and they see this skill or this talent or this attitude or trait that makes you successful in doing that you you get that the fourth p you get a lot of praise you mm. people say you're really good at this or you're really great at that or i appreciate the fact that you do that or think that and then i think uh you have peace peace of mind once you know that you're following your calling uh, the stress goes away because you know that someone other than you, a higher power, uh, in my in my thinking, it's it's God, but whatever that you know in your your life you think, but they, it gives you peace that you are going to be okay, that you're going to be able to make a living from it, and then there's a a pathway to mm. get it done. That's the sixth P. Uh, you know, I don't think that that you're going to have a calling to be an opera singer if you <laughs> don't have a good voice, you know. Uh, so you, when God calls you to do something, he prepares a path to get there. Yeah. Uh, he prepares the circumstances and a road. And so, you know, like I said, if you, you know, if you think, oh, I want to be an airline pilot and you're afraid of heights and you can't get over it, that's a good, or you have an ear, something wrong with your hearing and that you pat, you fell off the test, mm. that tells you that's not your calling. <laughs> so he, he gives you a path to get there. So I think those six P's have always helped me when I'm counseling with other people, when I'm speaking to people who say, you know, how can I find my purpose or my calling or get in the right job, find mm. the right slot things that will make me happy in my life. Beautiful. Those are the things I think about. Beautiful. Thanks for sharing the six, uh, the six P, uh, P's, right? So there's the plan, yeah. blood, person, practice, peace of mind, and, and, and pathway are the six P's yes. that you're sharing here. 
And then I, I want to understand the journey as a, uh, a writer, an author, to become a, a consultant. Uh, that that is you know to the to the public speaking and into a consultant it take is is it takes a lot of different strain and skill sets and, and different network yeah. different people you have to know yeah. yeah so how did you do it so beautifully can you share that secret well I'll have to say um, it was because I hated to market. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is, I was having lunch with an engineer, uh, happened to be vice president of engineering for a major oil company. And we were just having lunch after Sunday after church. And he said something about, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm doing some writing. And he got up, pulled a book off his shelf. And he said, this book, he said, we pay a lady to fly in here. And that was it. I was in Houston. Mm -hmm. He said, we pay a lady to fly in here from Atlanta to teach all of us engineers to write, do technical writing and business writing. We can't write. And I thought, you know, I know how to do that. I, I could teach them how to do that. And yeah. I could make it more money doing that. And so... Um, I wrote a book. I asked some friends to give me samples of business writing of all in all different industries. And I wrote a book on that. And very quickly, it took me four days to write that book wow. and sent it off. And then my agent was able to sell it. Uh, you know, she had gotten the book. I got an agent because of the first, you know, books on, on for young adults. And um, so when th that was my marketing plan. I couldn't imagine calling up people, call, call, you know, people I didn't even know. It's like, I come out and talk to you. So my plan was to become an author well known enough that calls would come to me. Ah. So when, when the book came out while I was waiting, you know, for the publisher to bring it out, um, I called on businesses and I said, you know, here's my name. This is what I do. I have a book on such and such. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it, it will be uh, released. And then of course, after it came out, I said, it has been released. Could I come out and talk to you about teaching your employees this? And they said, sure, we need help. And like I said I, earlier, I was mentioning uh, the Houston Chronicle mm. did a huge story on me, on, on the business that I was teaching business writing and people had trouble with their writing. And I didn't even have, I had no employees and I didn't even have, you know, a, an answer, a phone, cell phone like we have today. I had an answering service and I called in at noon and she said, I don't know what you did, but you have had 32 calls this morning for companies wanting you to come out and talk to them. Beautiful. And so that, <laughs> that really was my marketing plan. And I started calling on those companies. And the first client I had was an oil company who passed my name to another oil company who passed my name to another oil company. So being in Houston, I was working for all the major oil companies. And then the book did actually come out, mm. at, you know, three or four months later. And IBM saw me on the TV show that I already mentioned. And so I thought, oh, that's a new industry. Well, maybe I could do that. Mm. And so I started working for IBM. And then I just, you know, branched out and got into the financial industry and started hiring people. I got so many leads so quickly that I couldn't do them. I had all days booked. And so when IBM finally got convinced, yes, you know, you, you can certainly do this for a lot of people. Um, they said, can we give you 60 days next year? And I went, I, I don't have 60 open days. I'm totally booked for the year. Mm. So I thought, I don't want to lose clients. I've got to hire people. So at that point, I start, you know, I hired an assistant and I started hiring other trainers wow. to go out and do my programs. Wow. And that was actually in the first four years of business. The rest of the time, I was the content creator. I pretty much stayed behind my PC writing the books. I would see what's the problem in industry. What do people need a solution for? What are my clients complaining about when they come to the workshops? And I developed the material, then I developed a training program on it and trained other people to go out and actually deliver the programs. And then I would do the speaking. I would, if it was a major conference, you know, 5,000 people, then I would go, you know, do a brief little overview, sort of an intro. But if they wanted sustained learning for their employees, then I sent my consultants in to do you know, multi-day programs. Beautiful. So Diana, uh, when people say that's the, that it's important uh, in our success is a luck factor, and I think luck also plays a little role in, in, in your journey, but majority of the success comes from the intentions. So you intentionally wanted to become well-known author 
like you say earlier so that people will come to you for businesses instead of you coming to them asking for businesses and along the yes, way you know, yeah. let me interrupt you here for just a minute in and, and and our US culture basically if you're going to be well known to generate calls you have to be a movie star a pro athlete <laughs> or, a, or a, an author uh -huh. and so that's the reason I, you know, I can't throw a football so I couldn't be an athlete I don't have any acting talent so I couldn't be a movie star so I just thought being an author gets your work out there so that people call you and so it really was sort of the lazy person's marketing plan uh, I want to know what message you talk to yourself every single day back then to make sure that you're gonna stick with that plan to become a well-known author, though. I actually, I think I never talked to myself about I want to be a well-known author. That uh -huh. that never entered my mind after that first, you know, that first meeting I had when somebody was saying, "This mm. is people are calling me," and I thought, "How do I do this? How do I not market?" But what I what I was, and then looking back later, you know, I I know. That that's how people get inbound calls that people were saying you need to get inbound calls but I think what I was really thinking about is I love working with people I love teaching them a skill uh -huh. I mean I've just always been a teacher at heart when I write something I, I know how to explain it well mm. and I just love seeing the light bulb come on for people mm. uh, even when I was 30 years old I was in front of a workshop I mean, training doing classes and programs for 65 year old executives you know mm. who had been on the job for years and they didn't really have an efficient way to do certain farm letters that they send out they didn't have an efficient way to do an audit report or mm. a, you know a, a, an engineering report or a feasibility study and just being able to teach them and seeing the light bulb go on and they think Wow, we should have done, we should train everybody to do this. This is going to save us hours of reading time as executives when they're reading and you know approving things. That's what really motivated me. It wasn't so much from the beginning. I'm going to be famous. It was I want to do I want to to do something I feel passionate about. I want to do something that I can make a good living at. Mm -hmm. But I also want to help people do what they want to do. And so by doing the programs that on communication. You know, because I've always been under that communication umbrella, communication expertise. It changes everything. Mm -hmm. If you think of every relationship you've ever had, family, social, business, it's it's all your conversations stacked end to end. Wow. So if you can communicate better, then you can do anything you want. And that was my goal is to help people communicate. So basically, out of all the 49 books that I have written, half of them have been on communication because that's that opens the door for everyone else yeah and then and, and i noted down here that uh, you you really listen to your clients to figure out what bothered them what the problems they are facing with so that you can write something that you can create something that help them helping them solve the problems and and the the problem solving mindset is really 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 inside of you embedded into your thinking in your body and uh, i we want to know the secret uh, that that can help diana to to be able uh, to be a better listener so that you know other people will, will share with you you know their problems though yeah, I, I don't think anyone ever masters listening i think mm -hmm. we can all get better to listening um even though I've been studying this for more than three decades, mm -hmm. and my husband also, he, he quit his job after about 10 years and, and joined me. Uh, I had remarried, and he joined me in the business. Uh, I, I, a funny thing that happened I, that illustrates the point about not listening, no matter how much you want to listen or know to listen. I was, when I write a book, I work at my home office. And he came in one evening and he walked down the hall right past me. And I said, wow, it's really raining hard. My parents live about 30 minutes away in mm -hmm. Arlington where the Texas Cowboys play their games. So everybody's heard of that place. And I said, wow, it's really raining hard out there. My dad just called and said it's, that they've gotten two or three inches. He said, oh, he walked past. About 10 minutes later, comes back down the hall and he says, why don't you call your dad and see if it's raining over there? 
<laughs> and of course, we all, I think, I just told you that, that we, no matter how much we study and we read and we know we should listen, we don't always listen. But when it comes to customers, I, I have, I think, done a good job of that because, you know, I would be with, when I was working in certain companies, I might be with those attendees for two days mm. or, or four days in some cases. And I hear them complain about things. Mm. And it's always my boss doesn't listen or I, I can't get good feedback on my job or writing is taking me too long or we've got a major conflict because everybody's got a political agenda. And I just begin to those are all communication things. They're all communication things. Mm. So helping them and seeing real application in their job motivated me. Beautiful. As part of my thinking, how can I help them and I've got a concrete problem here that sure needs a solution and so that gave me the impetus to tackle the next thing and the next topic and the next topic and the next book. Wow and since we're on the talk for uh, for listening might you share any tips that can help you know us to become better listeners? I think uh, this, this is going to sound simplistic but I would say uh, decide you want to listen. You know, a lot of times people say things to us and it's just like noise. It's background noise because our mind is on something else. And I find that's true of myself. Somebody comes in and starts to say something and I'm in the middle of an email. I've gotten where I was. I used to sometimes just say, yeah, okay. And I acted like I was listening, but I really was focused on that email. Mm -hmm. So now I'm in the habit for the last, you know, <laughs> two decades or so to say, excuse me, can you hold that just a moment? I'm not listening. Let me finish. And I would write a sentence, you know, finish my thought uh -huh. and then turn back to that person to listen. So making up your mind that you intend to listen is, is the most important thing. Um, I think uh, clarifying, a lot of times we jump to, uh, to assumptions about what somebody's saying. They give us a piece of information and we think, oh, so their point is, and that's not their point at all. Mm -hmm. So if you can get to the habit of saying, uh, is what you're trying to tell me that you'd like me to do X or are you trying to tell me that you're not happy with your job and you want to switch to a different role? You know, I try to clarify mm -hmm. and many, sometimes it's right. Sometimes the conclusion I draw, I drew about what they said is wrong. Mm -hmm. And so making sure that you question and verify the conclusion you're drawing about what they say is another good listening tip habit. Beautiful, beautiful. So first we have to decide that we're going to listen, right? And then along yes. the way, you know, asking questions to make sure that we understand, the, uh, you know, what the other person say. Are we having the right understanding about that or, you know, we need to have some adjustments or so? Uh, yeah, you know, particularly that's important when you're giving directions as a manager, as an executive, uh -huh. when you delegate a project. Uh, if you say, people are in the habit sometimes of saying, uh, do you follow me? Or, are you with me? Mm -hmm. Or is that clear? Well, nobody's going to say, no, I'm stupid. It doesn't. I don't understand. Mm. Nobody says that. They always nod and act like, sure, I understand. So what you have to do as a speaker is to take responsibility yourself uh. by asking some questions to say, some, let's say you've delegated a project and as, as the executive, then you take the responsibility and say, uh, as you get this done, what, what, do you, what two or three steps do you think you will be taking or where do you think you're going to start on this project or uh, what's a reasonable timeline to get this done and by their answers then you the speaker can determine if they really understood mm. because they don't know that they don't understand <laughs> they don't know that they're on a different wavelength than you so it's really as a speaker it's your responsibility to question and make sure they understand and don't just let them say oh yeah sure I understand or it's clear when it may not be wow Thanks for sharing that, Diana. My last question, uh, you know, is, is about the advices so that we can, and you know, our listeners can can reflect and learn and can apply so that they can get better at certain things. And throughout our conversation, that's the three things that I think that uh, that really, really, uh, the people will really, really need advices from you. One is in the writing, one is in the communications, and one is in the in the in the speaking. Okay, so yes. I will leave the three for you to decide which kind of, you know, like area you want to write narrow uh, down next. So to give advice to our listeners, which one would you choose? Um, actually, I would say speaking, okay. but not necessarily, 
not speaking and writing are so related. It's not necessarily what you say, although I do coach people in presentation skills. Uh, I've done that for, for many years, many clients. But now to reach the world, you have to write. Yeah. You have to write, to, whether it's on social media, just a comment, or whether you are writing reports. You can do your job over in the corner and do it with excellence. Mm -hmm. But if nobody knows about that and the word doesn't get out, you, you don't expand your influence. So mm -hmm. I think eventually, even though you may speak well, you have to write it mm -hmm. so that it's in a it's like I said, it's on social media or it's a blog or it's an article or it's some kind of research paper or white paper or, or a book, which is gets more attention. I mean, nobody throws a book away. Mm -hmm. You get mail and you throw it away. You get a brochure, you throw it away. But when you get a book from someone, you don't toss that away. It's a, it's a free book yeah. and it's your advice and your thinking. And there are many executives who have solved a problem in their com in their company and they've done a great job. Or maybe it's an entrepreneur who started their own business and they they figured out a way to do it well and profitably and productively. Hmm. When you write that down, you, you dramatically expand your influence. Hmm. And also, again, it's a good marketing ploy. So uh, I, I encourage people to, to improve their writing so that they could write a book if they wanted to mm. and get the word out and, and it's as profitable you know you get paid for it but it also builds your business it builds your career it builds your visibility it gets you in the media uh, you sell foreign editions and it gets in every country so there's really nothing that can expand your presence and sell your products and your services better than a published book Thank you very much for sharing that, Dan. So we will take a baby step first. So how, you know, in order for us to write a book, then we have to be better at writing, right? So how can we take baby steps to get better at writing? Well, there, there are all kinds of books on writing. I mean, I have several on, online. Uh, I have a book called E-Writing, and uh, I have a grammar book out there. So I have books on that, and I teach that. I have a, actually have a, book it's called Boer book not boot camp but do Boer book camp where I teach people how to write you know what's involved it's not most of us can't if we're in the business world and have a professional degree most of us can write well we just don't know how and we think well and we know how to research so it's knowing the process mm -hmm. and there's where I go through the process and so I would say Learn the process. If you want to take baby steps, you can uh, write blogs. And, it, you know, on, on LinkedIn, there's a LinkedIn e-sign. You can send those out. And if you get a good response and a good following, I know I, I do one every two weeks. I, I comment on LinkedIn. I have a, you know, a good post it but two times a week. And then I send out on the third third post, I send out um a newsletter that's that's a baby step if you get good feedback people saying I love those ideas then learn the process to get your writing a bigger audience uh, and once you publish the book you're going to get a lot of reporters call you and they write articles for you they're, they're writing the articles based on your interview and so it really it really it jump starts any any business with any product or service to sell I mean think about it uh, the, the company that's pretty well known around the country, uh, Zappos, for shoes, they wrote about their, their customer service and their culture. Uh, blog, Hub, I think it's blog, Blogspot. Uh, the, their CEO wrote about something. I can't even remember what he wrote about, but it launched their company. Mm -hmm. There's another book. Uh, you know, a lot of people use the project management uh, software base camp. Mm -hmm. That again, their CEOs wrote a book on that, and it launched their product and the second product, and etc. Just put them on the map. Mm -hmm. So I, I think the, the baby steps are to learn the process that's involved and how you how you submit a proposal, what goes in a proposal. Uh, it doesn't have to be long. Sometimes a proposal can be as short as two pages. Sometimes it's you know forty pages. But learning how to write a proposal, how to get an agent, and then they submit your book, shop it around just like anything else that you were selling. Beautiful, beautiful. And Diana, 
Uh, thanks a lot for sharing your stories. And then we um, we know your past already. We know the work that you're doing now. Uh, let's travel into the future a little bit, and then we can conclude our conversation from there. Is that okay? Okay. Alrighty. So, is there anything that you are working on that are exciting you want to share with me and the audience so we can celebrate with you in advance? Well. I do a lot of writing for major companies, uh, blog writing, just ongoing. Microsoft, Forbes, I've been writing for Forbes for three or four years. Uh, but a major project, I just finished a book on healthcare, and I was co-authoring that with a, with a doctor, an, an orthopedic surgeon. Um, so I'm looking for the next book. I'm thinking that I may switch to go back to novel writing. I don't, I don't know. I'm just kind of taking a breather since the holidays. I've thinking about it for the last couple of weeks. I have a list about this long of books, ideas that mm. I could do. But really right now, what I'm really enjoying at this time in my life is coaching other writers. Uh. I, you know, I have other people who are speakers, who consultants and think I, I need to build my reputation. So they will frequently call and, you know, sometimes I spend an hour with them. Sometimes I spend two days with them. Or if they come to the book camp, I spend three days with them. But I really enjoy helping other people get their message out. And, of course, I learn, too. When I learn what their ideas are and what their expertise is, it's a fascinating learning experience for me in a, you know, in a topic, on a topic that I'm not familiar with. Yeah. So that's, that's what I've been uh, doing when I, when I started these book camps. I sold my training company hmm. about, uh, it's been about three years now. I sold that training company. So now I am helping other people build their businesses by doing the publishing. Beautiful, beautiful. So my last question to you is regarding to the word you just mentioned, thinking, all right? And uh, my wife and I have been on the quest to help people to improve their ability to think because we believe that our thinking capability actually is diminishing. And then uh, every chance we talk to experts like you, we will ask this question. And, and if people listen to your response, they can find something to reflect, to think, to learn and to apply to their thinking and hope that they will improve their thinking capability. And that is the, how the change start. Okay. So, Diana, how have you been expanding your ability to think? I think that the most frequent way is reading. Reading. The more you read, the more you, you start to ask your stuff important provocative questions like is this true mm. how do i know it's true uh what other conclusion could i come to besides the conclusion this author is trying to lead me to mm. uh what's fact and what's opinion just as you read it improves your thinking process mm. a second way other than just reading i think is to go to very smart people mm. and ask them questions about what you intend to do, your plan. Um, I, I, I wrote a blog once on thinking, how to think better, and one of, the, one of the points in that was to pretend that you have a board of directors. You, you may literally have a board of directors to go to, but if you're an entrepreneur and you, you don't have a, or you're just starting out and you don't have this group of people, mm. imagine you did. What, imagine you were on the board of directors when somebody would present an idea to you. What would you ask them? What would you ask them about their financing? What would you ask them about their staff? What would you want to know about their plans in the future? What would you want to know about their marketing? If you would think like an advisor mm. and think like you're a person, if you're starting a new project or product or service, what would a board of directors ask me? Yeah. And then prepare yourself. That helps you to think through any kind of project, any kind of plan that you want to do, even if it's financial planning for your family or uh, planning how to build character into your kids. That thought process comes from reading in many subject areas and applying maybe, maybe in different ways, but it also comes from your, your ability to listen to good advice and listen to feedback and apply it in your situation. Beautiful. And thank you so much for sharing, sharing your tips on how to help us to think better. And Diana, it's been a pleasure to know you and, and I'm so grateful for you to decide to join our show and share your amazing journey with our audience. 
I wish you well. I wish uh, your family all the best in 2023 and in many more years to come. And I look forward to seeing you in Vietnam one day. All right? Okay. <laughs> all right. Thank you. I've enjoyed being with you. Thank you very much. Have a wonderful evening. Okay. And say hello to your family for us, okay? <laughs> okay. Will do. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye for now.